We need to develop a theology as a practice and to understand why. Because how come the power of God that raised Jesus from the death is not more powerful than our ethnic loyalty in a time of conflict and war? We as a Christian, like many people, time of war, we retreat back to our tribal loyalty and we lose our loyalty to who Jesus is, his kingdom, and also for the body. Welcome to the Lausanne Movement Podcast, where we have a passion to accelerate global mission together. If you like today's episode, won't you take a moment to rate and review our podcast and subscribe? That way you won't miss a thing. And now for today's interview. Professor Monayer, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be with you. Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. Your journey and your ministry in reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians is both inspiring and I believe deeply impactful. And so we're going to be diving all into that whole idea and the whole ministry of reconciliation. But let's start by delving into your own personal history and the roots of your faith and your commitment to peace. Could you share a bit about your backstory with us? What were some of your early influences that you believe shaped your faith and your understanding and identity and your belief in coexistence? Yeah, thank you very much for the program and interview. Uh, as you uh, said, my name is Salim Munayer. I'm Palestinian, Christian, and Israeli citizen. For many people, that will be in contradiction. So Palestine is a bridge between Asia and Africa and Europe, and the Palestinian people are the mix from all those nations that an ethnic group that lived and came through the land. So in Palestinian ethnicity, you will have Jewish, Arab, Egyptian, Phoenician, Greek, Samaritan background, including Canaanite background that lived in the land. So that is the beauty of the people, of uh, the Palestinian people throughout history and the mix uh, of the people and the culture. The other aspect, Palestinian Christianity traces itself back to three main sources. One is the, the Jewish disciples of Jesus in the early church, the one that embraced Jesus and stayed in the land. And the other is Arab Christian. There were Arab people living in the land, they embraced Christianity, as we read in the book of Acts chapter 2. And more in the coast area, more Greek and Phoenician. So the three groups molded and came together as seeing themselves as a universal testimony that this is the land of the Father, the prophet. This is the land where Jesus was born. He taught, healed, crucified, and the tomb is empty. And that is very important message that Palestinian Christians want to carry it to the world. And as a result, we live in the places of his birth, uh, teaching Nazareth, Galilee, and also Jerusalem, of course, where I live right now. How I became uh, Israeli. 1948, my hometown, uh, we are one of the oldest Palestinian Christian family in the land. My grand-grandfather built the current church of St. George. St. George is a pattern of the Christian era, also a pattern of England and other churches. And St. George on the horse killing the dragon, the dragon here, from the book of Revelation resembles the empire. And I think that speaks a lot. So the city of Lida experienced massacre and the majority of the people of Lida have been ordered out. It was one of the biggest ethnic cleansing in 1948 when the Israeli forces pushed the Palestinian out of the city. It was defenseless city. My father chose to hide in the church that his grand-grandfather built. So the 200 Christian that found refuge in that church were able to stay and they became refugees in their hometown. And the area where they lived was a church. The soldiers that came and that's iron if it called it the Arab ghetto because many of the soldiers were coming from Europe after Second World War. So I born post 1948, Nakba, catastrophe, the people, uh, my people experience. And, uh, and the city turned into a mix, 70% uh, uh, Jews and 20% Palestinian that were able to stay 
Austin Christian and Muslim. So I grew up in a mixed ethnic culture group religion. I went to school that is Christian school, school where most kids were Muslim. And then I went to a Jewish high school. And in a Jewish high school, I got exposed to Jewish history, especially the Jewish experience in Europe. And I remember very clearly one of my friends asked me, are you Palestinian, Christian, or Muslim? I said, Christian. He said, oh, that worst. I'm talking about the early 70s, how people used to think about that time, learning about Jewish history, learning Talmud, learning about, especially about the Holocaust. And, and my faith as a Christian was presented as a very negative one that inflicted pain on my friends. So I was asking a lot of questions. I grew up in an Orthodox church, in the liturgy, it's a beautiful liturgy, but we did not have the biblical teaching and history, church history, in order to deal with the whole situation. Then the teacher gave uh, one of the most problematic issue in our conflict, what we call the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Palestinian historical narrative. And the teacher said, you see, this land was desert, and we, the Jews, came, turned the desert into a garden. And those Palestinians, there's no Palestinian people, just people came from the neighborhood country because we brought the economic prosperity. And then I couldn't be quiet, so I raised my hand. You know, remember, you're high school kids still, and the teacher's authority. And I said to the teacher, uh, please look for out of the window of the classroom. You see that building over there? This is a church. My grand-grandfather built it. Do you see the orange grove all around the airport, Ben Gurion Airport today has been called, before it was called Lit Airport. A lot of it used to be belong to my family. Matter of fact, the high school built on our land. And my, my grand-grandparents were uh, very well-to-do people. They used to export the famous Jaffa Orange. So you have the clash of historical narrative. And I could not agree because of my experience, because what I saw with the narrative that most of my Jewish friends were studying and we had a lot of discussion and argument. In that context, during the War of 73, where I went to, they asked me to volunteer in hospital to help. I was toward the end of my high school. This is a, was the shock of my life. Is that our destiny to be in wars, to be killed? And I, I decided that I really need to understand better, especially about how Christianity or Jesus addressed this issue, because my church at that time did not give me an answer. So I heard that my uncle and aunt house, there were a Bible study, so I decided to go. My uncle asked a concern for his children. He put an ad in the Jerusalem Post, who is willing to teach New Testament? in Hebrew. And to this ad, the Jewish Israeli answer, believers in Jesus. And we were, to my surprise, we were a group of the teenager uh, Palestinian and Jewish kids coming together and exploring. And here Jesus dealing with the Roman Empire, with occupation. Here Jesus dealing with corrupt religious leaders. Here Jesus dealing with gender issues. Here Jesus deal with issues that I'm struggling with. And his answer to those challenges also answered to my challenges at that time. And by then I moved to Tel Aviv University and, and you go through a lot of questioning, you a lot of search, and, and then that he committed myself there to Jesus. But the, the important things that happened at that time, that when I committed myself to the Lord, I found myself in my hometown, teaching Sunday school to the Palestinian kids. Then I got involved with a new movement that started at that time in the 70s, Jews that began to believe in Jesus. Before, we used to call them Jewish Christian. And in the 70s, many young Israeli Jews and Palestinians traveled around the world, met Christian, believed in Jesus, and came back to the land. At that time, most of the money, missionary or the teacher were people in my age. They looked very old at that time for me <laughs> and they didn't speak Hebrew or Arabic. So they asked me to teach. 
And when I started working with them, I found my calling and that what led me to move to ministry. Wow. You know, it's, it's so fascinating. You hear your heritage, where your family has come from, the experiences they've gone through, and even your early childhood experiences and the influences and the interactions that you've had with diverse groups of people and how that set a strong foundation for your life's mission. I would love to hear what got you particularly focused in on the Ministry of Reconciliation. Was there a moment that led you to decide that you were going to focus your life ministry on reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians? That's very interesting because I didn't want to initially. I, I, I did my master's degree at Fuller Theological Seminaries, studied theology in the state, came back in order to teach Israeli and Palestinian. Israel was teaching in Jaffa area and Palestinians in Bethlehem Bible College. And you leave the land for a few years, and you, when you come back, a lot change in the land, the politics, the relationship. And I was in shock when I went to Bethlehem and teach Bethlehem Bible College with the reality of the life, uh, closure, curfew, uh, uh, soldiers come to your house in the middle of the night. You don't have freedom of movement. But the questions that my students asked were very, very important. At that time, they did not teach it to systematic theology one, two, or three. For example, should I join demonstration against the occupation? Do we, as Christian, should we throw stones on the soldiers? What should we do in the situation where one of my students' father confronted Jewish settlers uh, that want to take over his land, this very famous story, Tent of the Nation. And his father come back home in tears because he's committed Christian, because when he showed the settler his land deeds, the settler pulled up the Bible, said, the Bible is my land deeds. The Bible to define us, define our Christianity, define who we are and what we are and all of that. Suddenly this Bible is being used a sword against us. And that is the most hurting things to Palestinian Christians, that they're encountering millions of Christians when they come to visit to the land, that they're using the Bible and verses of the, from the Bible selectively or certain theological understanding to tell us it's not our place, it's not our homeland, we need to move out. We are standing on the way of God fulfilling his end time theology. And all those issues, theology of the land, end time, really caused me to go into study. But at the same time, my Israeli Jewish students, that right now is defined as uh, Messianic Jews at that time, Jewish Christian, were dealing with a set of issues how we as a Jew that believe in Jesus in relationship to the history of the church with the Jewish people, especially post-Holocaust uh, in Europe and so on, dealing with that situation. So you deal with identities really in both camps, but from different perspective. So the first intifada, the uprising of the Palestinian in 1987, 88 started, and as we say, all hell got loose, you say in English? That's right. And so my Israeli Jewish students were asking me what the Palestinian Christians think. So I told them, they didn't like it. They attacked me. My Palestinian Christian students asked me what the Israeli Jewish students, they think, because both sides believe in Jesus. So we should be in agreement on theology and on history and on politics, because we are both believers in Jesus. I said to them in the end of the day, why don't you meet? You know, I found myself all the time in the middle, like a bridge. So we organized a meeting. It started nicely, like many meetings between Christians, the hallelujah stage, we worship or together, we read the scripture together from the Bible. They will know us by our love that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. By the time we finish, we start talking about the situation and it was catastrophe. It was disaster. So the, the next thing that happened is I said, oh, my students are not mature. My student doesn't know. They really are not understanding the situation and all of that. So 
I said, why shouldn't I bring pastors? So I brought seven pastors from the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. And guess what? The pastors are supposed to be praying, preaching. They were worse than my students. And this is the time I realized that the whole issue of reconciliation need a proper ministry, thinking, planning. We need to develop a theology as a practice and to understand why. Because for me, the challenge was, and still, how come the power of God that raised Jesus from the death is not more powerful than our ethnic loyalty in a time of conflict and war? We as a Christian, like many people, time of war, we retreat back to our tribal loyalty and we lose the, our loyalty to who Jesus is, his kingdom, and also for the body. Wow. Professor Salim, thank you for sharing the initial spark that, that got you into the Ministry of Reconciliation. As you were speaking close to the end there and how you spoke about how we go back to our tribes in time of war, I was even just reflecting on my own experience during COVID, how COVID itself, although not a war situation and nothing like you're experiencing right now, also separated Christians into their different tribes and they couldn't come together yeah. and reconcile under True. the name of Christ. And I would love for us to unpack a bit of the ministry of reconciliation and the process that you take with the people that you, you're doing ministry with. But I would love just to hear a bit about how you got your ministry of reconciliation off the ground. What was the initial vision? You've shared the backstory to it. And what were the practical steps that you took to get that vision into reality? And, uh, you know, with every kind of vision and every new ministry and every attempt to bring reconciliation, there are these challenges that we face. I'd be interested to hear what the initial response was to your attempts and how you overcame those challenges and what lessons you learned. So out of this pressure set, we need to take it seriously. When people are dying, people are killed, the hatred is, 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 is affecting all our communities. So I called a friend of mine from the Messianic community and Palestinian Christian community, more in the evangelical spectrum of the Christian in the land. I said, I don't know what's going on and how we're going to do that, but we need to be obedient to Jesus. So we started the NGO in 1990. So in the beginning, I have attempted, we have attempted to have several meetings and all those meetings ended up in disaster. And the obstacles were at several levels. One obstacle that uh, there is a theological obstacles when I, and also how we're going to do about going about it. And I found out that how we're going about promoting Reconciliation is also theologically, but in the beginning, I didn't think so. So most evangelical Christian here in the land, like many people and Christian, the priority was evangelism. So, you know, people believe in Jesus, they be baptized, join the church, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't sleep around, and which was a rapture. So that was the mind of people. And peace and reconciliation and promoting the principles that affect all our life was low on the priority. People used to say to me, what, are, what you are doing is humanistic because we need to prepare people for the end time. And what you're doing is social and political gospel. It's not the whole gospel. And so that was a big problem. Then another question is how you deal and how you promote reconciliation with people that they are not, they don't believe in Jesus. So it's okay, you know, we believers need to come together from both sides. We can share the gospel, we can pray together, we can worship together. And then, you know, we will help each other in time of crisis. And that was a problematic and, and I'm being mild about the theological objection. And with the journey, I see Second Corinthians chapter 5, the most important from verse 17. With Christ's event, a new creation have started. God is reconciling the world to himself. God is calling us to join him in his work of reconciliation. We, this is our ministry. This is our message. This, we are ambassadors. So the whole world 
the whole cosmos, including creation, is a subject, is a place where we are promoting reconciliation, including everybody. There are several areas. One area there is what we call the physical obstacle, ability to meet with each other, because we are very segregated community politically. There's so much fear. There's checkpoints. There's walls. We're living in different neighborhoods. There's fear. The second is emotional. Emotional fear. There is real fear. There's imaginary fear. There is manipulative fear. Our political leaders manipulate our fear for their political agenda. And then you have hatred, enmity, complacent, like I don't care or not willing to take responsibility. And the third stage that is the most obstacle, the biggest one, is the social psychological. Us and them. We are the good, they are the bad. We are the Christian, they are the Jews and the Muslim. We are the children of God and we are the chosen, they are not chosen. We mean well, they mean evil. And you enter into severe process of dehumanization, demonization, where you don't see your neighbors as created in God's image and likeness. And that give license to kill the neighbors. So there is also in all of that a huge imbalance of power. In our situation, the Israeli are much, much more powerful than the Palestinian. The life situation is different. The systematic of the legal system, like uh, similar to South Africa, different law to different people, access to economic ability for access to education and so on. So those who were huge obstacles, it's not simple, realizing the obstacles, how big they are, out of desperation, I took a group of 15 Israeli and 15 Palestinians to the desert. And I decided to go to the desert out of desperation. And here I am in the desert with a group of Israeli Palestinian. And during the first Intifada, we're talking in the 90, early 90s. 90. So we, say, we have the typical, what we call, first stage of reconciliation, uh, dipping the hummus together, kumbaya, hallelujah stage. We prayed, we worshiped, night time come, the Israeli went to sleep in one side, the Palestinian went to sleep in the other side. So in the morning I got up and I asked the man that has the, the place, if you have 15 camels, he said yes, he brought 15 camels. On each camel, put Israel and Palestinian, and we cross the desert on camels. Even some of the places that also our fathers went. And to my amazement, after initial resistance, by the third day, they become friends. And I ask myself the question, why? First, because the imbalance of power disappeared. They are on equal ground. Second, they discover that each other are human, each other created in God's image. It's not us and them. We are together in the desert. Your enemy becomes the source of your survival and not the person that you compete with. And the desert has the spirituality. God took slave-minded people into the desert to transform them. We are slave to the conflict, to hatred, to enmity. Even so, Many of us believe in Jesus, but still certain aspect of our pattern of thinking, the way we see each other, the feelings, the emotions, still we are enslaved and we need to be liberated. And as God liberated slave-minded people, as God liberated David and Moses, and also Jesus went to the desert, the struggle of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus was with our temptation. Are we faithful to the kingdom of God or to allegiance to political national state? Are we compromised on material things instead for the kingdom of God? So all those ideas and power still working today. And when we came into the desert, also in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talk about when we come together as living stone, this is a place of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that what happened. You feel, you sense the Holy Spirit. You, you see the, drama, the dramatic life-changing experiences because many times when I preach, I know 
that by in two hours, 90% of what I have preached is going to be forgotten. But when you experience it, it's become part of you. Wow, Salim, there's so much there that we could unpack. You've spoken about the barriers of theology, the barriers of politics, barriers of, I've written a bunch of them down, emotional, social, psychological, and breaking all of those down is not a challenge. It, it almost feels insurmountable. But over the years, you've dedicated your ministry to breaking those barriers down. So could you take a moment to help us understand the process of reconciliation? You, take, you, you mentioned you've gone into the desert, you put them on camels together, but I know that there's far more to it than that. So could you share with us what the process yeah. is, how you take individuals and gro groups through that so you can break down those barriers so they can see each other as human again? Yes. First of all, we, in the beginning, we were just desperate, trying to get whoever want to come. Right now we have, like, for example, our civil society group from Boss community. We rec uh, recruit around 15 people from each community. Now, and when we recruit 15 uh, people from each community, it's, it's a hard process to convince people to come to it. Their first meeting together is in going to be in the desert. They're not going to meet in any other place. And they have to commit themselves for a year or year and a half process that they will meet from the 10 weekends. They have to meet eight weeks. So this is very good. You have to commit yourself. So the first stage, you go to the desert and you build the relationship and they have transformation of identity in the desert. So the first stage, usually what we saw, that reconciliation goes through six stages. The first stage that I described several times, it's a hallelujah stage, a kumbaya stage. The second stage is a stage where people begin to unload their grievances and people are shocked when they hear how the other sees them. Their identity as individual and their identity as group is being challenged and hurt. So the powerful group, for example, in our situation, the Israeli feel, some of the Israeli Jews feel guilty. Oh, I want to see the Palestinian. They are my brothers and sister. I want to meet them and understand them. The Palestinians are coming to the meeting. They're not coming to develop relationship. They're coming and saying, I want to change my life situation. There is systematic of injustice. I'm not so much interested in having being friend with you. And they challenge them about the reality of life. So the Israeli Jews that come to the meeting, they become the victim of the frustration of the Palestinian from the situation. They have a very hard time and hurting time. The third stage is withdrawal. We will never understand each other. And confirm previous suspicion about people. The old dehumanization, demonization, racism that we've been brought up, heard from childhood, at home, at school, and even sometimes in our churches. So that lead to withdrawal. So our desert experience break this third stage of withdrawal. We don't lose as much people because we learn that in order to have good encounter, you know, my American friends used to tell me in the past, what is your problem, Israeli and Palestinian? Why don't, don't you just sit together and talk it out? This is an assumption that many people, if you sit and talk it out, it will work out. Now I, I'm asking them that question. And they, are, they realize it's so complicated and not easy. In order for encounter between two groups of people to be successful, you need neutral ground. You need equal in power of leadership. You, you have to have common goal and no competition. And if those ingredients are there, that help people to move to the stage four. Stage four is very important. This is a stage where we look into our exclusive identity, our historical narrative. This is a stage where we entering into forgiveness, repentance. This is a stage we look into our historical narrative and check and see what is not right and not true. And we attempt to build a third narrative where my identity, my dignity is kept, but it's welcoming also the neighbor. 
So into my identity, I can embrace the other. And that is really important step because without identity transformation, and for Christian, identity transformation of Christ, if you are secure in Christ, if you have safety in Christ, you can welcome anyone else. If you don't feel uh, secure and safe, you will have exclusive identity. And that is a stage for the most critical groups that are able to build joint narrative, historical narrative, can move to the next step, they can risk addressing grievances in stage six, where we take action. And what we found out that many of the groups, our groups went through tremendous changes. Some of the people that went through our first desert trip until today, they're friends, until today they're working together. But reconciliation entail every aspect of life. So we have found out that when we ask people to be impacting the social fabric of their society or to put pressure on political powers, they receive so strong pushback that the impact is not fully on the people. So right now we are uh, uh, saying, we are saying, we're studying how we as Musala has Minister of Reconciliation Reconciliation, empowering our people, giving them the tool, the ability that they together, the Israeli and Palestinian, co-resist the situation. We're not only saying that the occupied need to be liberated. We're not only saying that the oppressed need to be liberated. We're saying also the oppressor, the powerful, need to be liberated from what he's doing, what he's doing to the others. So the core resistance is to require both people. Could you share a story of transformation? So you've, you have these, you have people connecting. Is there any one story that really just stands out to you of breakthrough that you witnessed in your ministry? Yes. Uh, there's so many stories. Maybe I use uh, two of them. When I was teaching at the college one time, one of my students were very, very hostile to me. And I didn't know why he was hostile. Then uh, somebody came, because he heard that I am promoting reconciliation with Israeli Jews, so he was very angry with me. So I found out that his father, in one of the marches in near Bethlehem, his father got shot by the soldiers in his stomach and led to bleed in the main street, and nobody was allowed to come to help him. So he, as, as a teenager, his father was a hero. His life, all his life had changed. So he grew up with this sense, I want to take revenge. I want to hit. I want to do something for them to feel my pain. That's what he was growing with. So after more than a year attempt, we went to the desert and we went to the Red Sea. And he didn't know how to swim. So my Jewish colleague took him on his hand in the water. He had to let go. Mm. And he went through total transformation that he decided not to take revenge, not to take violent action. Another uh, young man is Israeli Jews, grew up in very ultra religious family city. He joined one of the Kahana groups, uh, you know, the Jewish militant groups, and he hated Palestinian, hated Arab, and he, he just, he, he didn't know, he just was looking for opportunity to do something. But one day he had a crisis, and he left his community, and he met another person that uh, she was her father, grandfather, a prominent rabbi. And they were talking together and she said, she told him, listen, I'm joining Salahad, do you want to come? And he said, I'll give it a try. He was taking step of risk and step of faith. He came and he was angry. He was hostile. And you could see for every time in the process, how peel after peel is like an onion, it's the misconception, the dehumanization, demonization, the fear, the hatred is going away. 
and now right now he's one of our best recruiter in his community. So somebody that you see on the news, for example, one of our ministers coming from that background and you know promoting all of that, and he used to be part of that groups when he came out of it, and he's building bridges. He and he wants to learn Arabic. So there there are many many people like this. But we need to also to remember something that been found out by Erica Chenoweth. She studied nonviolent uh, nonviolent resistance and peace group. And she found out if we're able to mobilize 3.5% of the population, especially women, pressure from the grassroots to the, to the top will bring a change. And this is a very important lesson for us, that we need to build the critical mass in order to change the structure. It's happened in Liberia with the women in Liberia during the Civil War. It happened in Northern Ireland. It's happened in Manila. It's happened in Argentina, civil rights movement. We don't hear a lot about them because many of us are thinking or we, expect, uh, we have certain kind of expectation that our political leaders will bring the change. They will not. They have too much to lose because their position and privilege will be challenged if we have peace. But peace is needed by the people, all people, and grassroots movement, the impact, effect. And this is basically what Jesus did. Jesus said, let's develop a grassroots movement of disciples, men and women, that come together in an ecclesia and a church, and they change the world. And that's also what we need to do. It did happen. It's happening around the world. And I hope and I pray and work that will happen also in this part, in my part of the world. Well, thank you for sharing those stories of transformation. I think they're deeply moving. And I think it highlights the importance and the impact of your ministry and reconciliation and that that whole idea of getting a, a tiny mass of people and how that group could change a society is certainly something that, that we need to be praying into, especially within your current context and circumstances. Now, the time of recording, Israeli-Palestinian conflict is at a, one of the highest points that it's been in, in my lifetime, at least. You've had yes. decades of experience as from the 90s till this point. In your opinion, how do you view the current state of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict compared to the past? And what changes have you observed and how have these influenced and impacted the work on reconciliation? Yes. First of all, this is one of, your question is very important because one of the biggest issues that we, in promoting rec reconciliation, we need to define in what, in what we deal, which type of conflict we're dealing with. It's like you go to medical doctor, he does the diagnosis for you about your blood pressure, temperature, and so on. And this is very, very important to understand. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Israeli Jews, because there's some Israeli are not Jews, came about because there is a group of people living in Eastern Europe, Jewish people, that they were suffering from classical religious discrimination, anti-Semitism. With it become political. With in the 19th century, the Jews were the ultimate other in Europe. It's not only religious, it's become political and become toxic. So some of the Jews wanted to go to America. America closes doors. And some of the Jews said, if Europeans are having a solution to their problem in the context of nation state, we need also to have a nation state for us to protect our identity, who we are as Jews, and also physically. And they started a, pro uh, uh, a new ideology, Zionism. Zionism is a national movement of the Jewish people. Until the 19th century, majority of the Jews did not want to have a political state or a political entity as a result of the experience of Second Temple era. So we live as a religious community like Amish all around the world. So they, the, the Zionism is a national movement of the Jewish people. So that was brought a lot of energy and excitement, and but also been influenced very much by Christian groups that I'll talk about it in a minute. But the problem is 
when they chose to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, Palestine was not empty. There were people living there. There were Palestinian Christian, Palestinian Jews, and Palestinian Muslim. So in order to be able to establish a Jewish state in Palestine, the Zionist movement needed the help of empire. And the empire that come to help them in the end is Britain. Why Britain helped the Zionist movement? One, because its leaders were anti-Semitic. They didn't want all those million Jews to come to Britain. If you describe the Eastern European Jews at that time in the newspaper described as dressed in black, speak Yiddish, they're different, they smell. Like we talk about refugees today, Muslim refugees. Second, they wanted to have some, in the breakdown of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, a Western entity to help them in the Middle East. Make oil, trade routes, the Suez Canal. There are political, economic, and many reasons why they help, but there's also another reason that's very important that influence very much until today many evangelical Christian. The theology or the narrative that the Jews outside the land are the Jews that the one left the land. Some, yes, but majority of them were converted into Judaism throughout the century. So there is a concept of return. It's a settler colonial concept with religious and racial justification, it's religious. The Jews need to come back in order to rebuild the Davidic kingdom in order to inaugurate the Gog and Magog and second coming of Jesus. It is anti-Semitic because the Jews become an instrument for non-Jew Christian salvation. It's not caring for Jews as they are. And matter of fact, they, Zionism, Christian Zionism and Nazism, they have the same idea that there is no place for Jews outside the land. They need to be anti-Semitic in Europe, didn't want to see Jews there. Hitler would want to kick the Jews from Europe. Then when he realized he cannot do that, so in the end of 41, 42, he start exterminating them. Yeah. So the whole idea of the end time is very, very important. The other uh, aspect is that there is this idea that the Christian world are in a battle with the Muslim world. And that is not accurate because the conflict is a settler colonial group of people, desperate need for safety. In order to have it, they are being settling and moving out the indigenous people, the Palestinian. So you have that religious aspect to it. When the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, what's happened with the guilt of the church in the West and the Western power, there was a process where the Jews become almost Christian, and we develop a concept of Judeo-Christian uh, civilization that rabbinical Jews will not accept. And many Jews wanted to be part of Western society, Western elite. They become white, but the Arab and the Muslim still be the ultimate other. And Palestinian Christian and Arab Christian in their writing, we are half Christian. We're not really true Christian. We're not full Christian. And as a result, the sentiment is not with us because we are not part of the family. And that is really in contradiction to the most important teaching of Jesus. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of your, en your enemy. Let's say that I disagree, that the Muslim are the enemy. We as a church, we should not support any king that holds the sword against them. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, renewal of the mind, we need to change our mind, the love among us. But when your enemy is hungry, you feed him. Today, it is real in Gaza. If your enemy is thirsty, you give him water. If he doesn't have food, doesn't have shelter, you shelter him. And I hear so many leaders are not really walking and doing what God is calling them. This 21st century, what's happening in Gaza, it will be remembered for, for generations as one of the most shameful, shameful 
of Western leadership and also the many of Czech leadership that have not called for to stop it and for peace. So we are living in a situation right now as a result of the idea that you can manage conflict. And that was the idea because the weak, in our case, the Palestinian, you know, they will rebel from time to time and we will be able to handle it. There is no conflict that can be managed if you do not address the deepest needs of people for the Jews and also for the Palestinians. So that is a very, very important issues. So what's happening right now, we are, the, what were, is uh, happening with what happened in 48, our, from 48 until now is the moving of the Palestinians or trying to eliminate their identity. And that is something that it's happened all the time. And it is, there is a certain blindness to the life of the Palestinian, you know, just the number of children. You have people already five months without food and water, electricity. And you ask yourself the question, how come in the 21st century, this kind of things happen? With understanding, of course, that, that Israeli has the right to defend its citizen. Nobody said that. That is given, and every time the leaders say Israel has the right to defend itself, yes, defend its citizen, no, no problem. But, but what's happening right now, it's not only in Gaza, it's also in the West Bank. Yesterday we had Palestinian killed, today we have Israeli killed, and the settlement is expanding in a different form. It's happening also in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. So the situation is very very dear. It's very dear. I hope the right word in English. It's, it's catastrophe. It's, I, I have a hard time in the last few months seeing the children, the mothers being killed from both sides. It, it's just, it's, I have, didn't realize how emotionally I, I am reacting, responding to all of that and to hearing the stories of mothers from both sides, children been uh, uh, killed or kidnapped in both community and all of that, what's happening all around us. It's really, really uh, difficult for me that, to see that. But at the same time, I'm very much hopeful because today, everywhere around the world, there is a realization that the Israeli-Palestinian issue has to be resolved in one way or another. And some people call it two-state solution, sadly to say that is they're not telling us the truth. Two-state solution have long time, is impossible to, to, to have it. We need to have a new framework, political framework, where Israeli Jews and Palestinian can live equally and safely with dignity and ability to prosper and to bless each other. So the two-state solution does not solve the problem. The two-state solution is ellipse. They, they were talked to politicians in Europe and America talked about it and the Arab world talked about it long time. That is just lip service. It's not real because the reality on the ground is totally different. So that is exciting if we can take the opportunity to bring fundamental change to the situation today that will like what's happened from out of this tragedy, something great will happen for both people. Well, you've really tried to unpack something that is extremely complicated, not only locally within your context, but globally as well. In your opinion, what are some widespread misconceptions that you've noticed at the international level? You've had the opportunity to interact with global leaders. What are some misconceptions that you notice coming through? I think there are several misconceptions. First of all, about the conflict. This conflict is between two people living in the land. Is the conflict, the settler colonialism conflict, come as it did expand before out of the dispersion of the Jewish people in Eastern Europe, but it came on the account of the Palestinian. This is one thing that is very important. The misconception, for example, about that there is no Palestinian Christians 
in Palestinian Christians are a part of the Palestinian people. They're part of the culture and political leadership. Most of our university uh, until recently were established by Christians, Bethlehem University, by the Catholic Church, Birzeit University, many universities and colleges. So the Palestinian Christian tickled part of the people. So the other misconception is that I think that there is the deep dehumanization, demonization that's happened in many places about Muslim people in, uh, in general and Palestinian Muslims in general, you know. For me, Israeli Jew, Palestinian Christian, Palestinian Muslim are equal I mean, before God. And their life is God love all those people and care for their life. So the misconception that Muslim fundamentally are not capable of doing peace with people. That Muslim want to kill all the Jewish people, all the Christian people. The misconception that this conflict is went for 2,000 years from the time of Isaac and Ishmael. Matter of fact, that this conflict started in 1917 when Britain, with the Balfour Declaration, endorsed the Zionist political uh, plan for a uh, political state. It was not a problem for Jews to come to live in the land. It's a problem when the Jews want to have exclusive Jewish state in the Holy Land. That is the issue. There is another misconception is that Palestinians don't want peace. Palestinians want to have peace. Sadly to say, all of that is covered, shaded, and cause blindness by Christian, Christian Zionist political ideology that is also uh, white supremacy, giving to a race supremacy on other people. When you say that this one ethnic group, one race, is more important than other people, that is a problem. You know, we have, are in the process of releasing the State of the Great Commission report, and one of the report's findings had to do with hope thisness globally across the world. And one of the questions it's exploring is where does hope lie? And so as you reflect on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, how would you answer that question? Where does hope lie? Hope lie in Christ. Christ is our hope. God in Christ loved the world, cared for the world, and God is working in history and through human. So God has not left his creation. God is engaging. But the way God is engaging in the world is different than our engagement. God engaging the world and changing the history, moving the history of the world to a certain destination. God is working through people. It's amazed me when you start talking to people, how many people, you know, you see it. How many people leaving home and paying high price to go and call for justice? It, it's grassroots people. The prophetic voice is coming from the street, not from the uh, church political el elite. Because people, they feel, because they are created in God's image, when something is wrong, something is evil. And it took it a while, but people are risking work places, universities, positions to speak up and asking for justice. And the hope is in the people that God through his Holy Spirit is working. Mm -hmm. So the question comes to me with a evangelical general, and you're from South Africa too. How the evangelical church missed the story with Chile? How the evangelical church missed the situation in South Africa? And how the evangelical church is missing the situation in the MENA region, Nizer and Palestine? I'm, I'm generalizing. I know that. Mm -hmm. Because there is, we need to look back into the concept of kingdom of God. We need to divorce ourselves from this notion of exceptionalism. We are coming to serve people. We need to come to help people. We need to come to assist people. We need to come. We are coming to bless people, not to dominate people. And we're using theological language to dominate people. 
And our theology is political theology. That is something that you have it in South Africa, but still exists right now as we see the reaction of many Christian leaders in general and evangelical leaders to the Israeli Palestinian company. Well, Salim, thank you for sharing a bit about the hope that you have. I think particularly that idea of like focusing in on the fact that God is our source of hope and that God can work through people to bring transformation and bring change. And that should be our prayer as we consider the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and as well as the conflicts that are happening throughout the world. This world is full of brokenness and we're experiencing this in every nation. Do you have any closing thoughts as we bring this podcast interview to a close? Do you have any closing thoughts or comments that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yes, I think from my generation, we need to have honest reflection on what we did in the last 40, 50 years as evangelical, what brought blessing, what have caused damage. We need to ask ourselves the question, why so many young people are leaving the churches? What hurts them? What, why, and how we are driving many people out of the church? Why our message is not being accepted? or the way we do it. We need to have really deep, deep, deep self-reflection. Also, probably it was a lot of repentance. The other one is the, we have to ask ourselves the account of history, I call it. History has its own justice time. Where have we been and what we did and what we felt when so many people around us were suffering. And I'm afraid that we are going to, our children are going to ask us the same question they asked after Second World War. Where have you been, daddy, grandpa, grandfather, when those terrible things happened? Did you speak up? Did you stand for truth? Did you stand for peace? What have you done at that time? What is in our theology that causing so much pain to people when Christian theology is supposed to be a blessing to others, to my neighbor, to my enemy. Why it's so hurting? Saying that, but also I'm so encouraged with young people like you and others that are taking Jesus seriously in his kingdom and asking yourself the questions, what that's mean for my generation. And I have to say our legacy of our generation in some areas is good, but also our legacy is not so good. And the, ref- the focus, the epic place, space that reflect the situation is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because it's a crossroad. It's a place of meeting all those issues, all those ideology, politics, power that where we fail. And can we still, some of us have the time to change it? And it is quite a bit challenging for me, for many people. And I'm so happy that there are young people, men and women, that they are taking the challenge and they want to move ahead. Because when the prophet Elijah has told God, I am the only one left. God said, no, there is 7,000. God has more than 7,000 of people as such. And I want to encourage young people in the messy, terrible reality we're living is to trust God and to be obedient to his kingdom. Well, with that, Dr. Salim, thank you so much for this enriching conversation, for sharing your experience with us, sharing part of your ministry with us, sharing some of your perspective of what's going on within the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. For those interested in learning more about you or about your organization, about reconciliation, where can we point people? Is there a specific website we can send them to? How can they get in touch with you? They can go to Musalah Vision of Reconciliation website, and there is information about the ministry and also the way to be in touch with, with us. I'll make sure to put that into the show notes. Professor, 
It's been an absolute honor to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Your dedication to reconciliation and peace is a testament to the power of faith and hope and love and action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Blessings.